symptoms of constipation or diarrhea, using our mnemonic Olcarts as our guide, we note the onset or when did it start. For duration, we want to know are we having the constipation or diarrhea constantly with every bowel movement? And if so, we would like to note how many bowel movements we've been having per day. Or is this more intermittent, for example, after a meal? And if that's the case, we would like to note how many episodes of diarrhea, for example, we've had since. For progression, we can note in the case of constipation if the bowel movements appear to be occurring less frequently, or in the case of diarrhea if they appear to be occurring more frequently. To characterize the constipation or diarrhea, we know by now, since it is a bodily fluid, to use our mnemonic A, B, and C for the amount, blood, and color for our patient note, aggravating and alleviating factors, and treatments tried. And again, for our patient note, if there are no aggravating or alleviating factors, we'll also be sure to include that to receive the full credit. For all cases, we should order a rectal exam, CBC, serum electrolytes, and an x-ray of the abdomen. In functional constipation, our supporting points will include constipation, which is typically defined as less than three bowel movements per week, and straining. We'll add to our workup a colon transit study. In hypothyroidism, we'll see constipation, a weight gain, cold intolerance, and fatigue. We'll add a TSH and T4. In irritable bowel syndrome, we're going to use the Rome criteria, which include constipation with alternating diarrhea, abdominal pain, and three, aggravated or alleviated by defecation. We can also see tenasmus or the urge to go. Our workup for IBS focuses on ruling out other conditions, so we'll order a hydrogen breath test to rule out lactose intolerant, antibodies to antitransglutaminase to rule out gluten enteropathy, and a colonoscopy to rule out IBD. In hemorrhoids, we'll see constipation with hematochesia, possibly as well blood on the toilet paper, and an anal mass and we'll order a PT and PTT as we do for any case that involves blood. In an anal fissure, we'll see constipation, hematochesia, straining, pain and pain on defecation. We'll also include a PT and PTT. In diverticulosis, we'll see constipation with painless hematochesia and a poor or low fiber diet. We'll add a colonoscopy and a PT and PTT. In diverticulitis, We'll see constipation and now with painful left lower quadrant hematochesia. We could also note nausea and vomiting, and we know by now to use our mnemonic A, B, and C to include in our patient note the amount, blood, and color of any vomitus. And we could also have a poor or low fiber diet. And this time we're going to order a CT of the abdomen because a colonoscopy would be contraindicated due to the risk of perforation. And we'll include a PT and PTT for any case that involves blood in the stool. In colorectal cancer, we can see constipation, hematochesia, and the characteristic weight loss or a decrease in appetite seen with cancers. Our patient will also typically be greater than 50 years old with a positive smoking and family history. And we'll add a colonoscopy, a CT of the abdomen, and a PT and PTT. On the diarrhea side, for hyperthyroidism, we'll see diarrhea with a weight loss, heat intolerance, and anxiety or increase of worry and palpitations and we'll add a TSH and T4. In malabsorption, and this can be written as secondary to lactose intolerance or gluten enteropathy, we'll see diarrhea, and it can be aggravated by certain foods, for example, dairy or gluten. We'll also have a weight loss and or a steria or bulky and oily stools. We'll include a hydrogen breath test for lactose intolerance and antibodies to antitransglutaminase for gluten enteropathy. In irritable bowel syndrome, we're gonna use the Rome criteria again, which include diarrhea with alternating constipation, abdominal pain, and aggravated or alleviated by defecation. We can also see tenasmus or the urge to go. And our workup again focuses on ruling out other conditions. So we'll order a hydrogen breath test to rule out lactose intolerance, antibodies to antitransglutaminase to rule out gluten enteropathy, and a colonoscopy to rule out IBD. In gastroenteritis, we'll see diarrhea with hematochesia, crampy abdominal pain, nausea and vomitus, and if we do see any vomitus, we'll be sure to write down the A, B, and C's for our patient note and a history of travel or restaurant. We'll order a stool leukocyte, OMP, culture, and a shiga toxin and rotavirus assay, and we'll include a PT and PTT for any blood found in the stools. In mesenteric ischemia, we'll see diarrhea, hematochesia, crampy abdominal pain that is out of proportion to the physical exam, and classically, our patient will be greater than 50 years old with a history of atrial fibrillation. 
will include a CTN geography and a PT and PTT. Both infectious colitis and ischemic colitis can be thought of as similar to gastroenteritis and mesenteric ischemia. In infectious colitis, we'll see diarrhea, hematochesia, nausea, and vomiting, for which we'll be sure to include in our patient note the A, B, and Cs, a fever, and a history of antibiotics in the case of C. diff or restaurant exposure in the case of E. coli. And we'll order a stool leukocyte OMP and culture and a C. diff and shigatoxin, along with a PT and PTT for any blood found in the stools. In ischemic colitis, we'll see diarrhea with hematochesia, crampy abdominal pain out of proportion to the physical exam, and classically, again, our patient will be greater than 50 years old with a history of atrial fibrillation, and we'll add a CT angiography and PT and PTT. Finally, in inflammatory bowel disease, which includes Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, we'll see diarrhea with hematochesia, abdominal pain, tenasmus, or the urge to go, and now we can see systemic symptoms as well, including a decrease in weight and fever. We'll include inflammatory markers ESR and CRP, a CT of the abdomen, colonoscopy, and PT and PTT. Okay, we'll start our abdominal exam with a hand sanitizer, and we want to ask our SP if we have permission to examine you. Okay, we'll start with the hint exam. We'll look into his eyes if we're going to be concerned about, about jaundice in an abdominal case, so we'll make a comment that there's no scleral icterus, and look down, please. Okay, we'll move on to the oral pharynx, so we'll use a tongue depressor here. The key thing to do is you don't want to add too much pressure. For the SP, so just very lightly, you can press down, ask them to please stick out your tongue. Okay, and we'll comment that we don't see any uh, lesions. You can uh, visualize the thyroid and see if there's any visible lesions. And a good tip is to offer the patients a glass of water to see if it will help them swallowing. Would you like a glass of water to help yeah, swallowing? Okay, thank you. okay, so the next thing we could do is then feel for the thyroid, so you ask them to take a swallow. Okay, and we don't feel any masses, and we could do one on one side at a time. And then with the thyroid, we're going to introduce this mnemonic that we'll see again with the MSK exam, which is MSRP, and a manufacturer suggested retail price. And so this mnemonic will help guide you along with the thyroid exam, the other components to look or to check for thyroid uh, issues. So we'll start with the M, which is motor. So ask the patient to please make a muscle, and we'll test his motor strength. So he has five out of five flexion and five out of five extension. No real need for sensation, like a neuro exam for the thyroid, but we're used to this opportunity to let it hold as a placeholder for cyanosis and, and delayed cap refill. So we'll go ahead and look at his fingernails, and you don't see any cyanosis. And we could press on his fingers, and we don't see any delayed cap refill. We'll look at his reflexes. So we're going to look at his biceps reflex. We'll place our thumb on his biceps tendon, and this would, uh, his normal reflex would produce a two plus response, okay? And if we were concerned for a case of B12 or hyperreflexia, he would have a three plus response. Okay, you would see that. Uh, now we could uh, assess his radial pulses as well. So we could do one at a time, two at a time if you're more comfortable, and we'll verbalize that it's a two plus pulse, regular rate and rhythm. After we completed the MSRP for his upper extremity, we can now move down to his lower extremity and we could do the same thing. His motor response on his lower extremity, so I'll go ahead and kick out for me. So he has a 5 out of 5, and then bend in, so a 5 out of 5. And now for sensation, for his lower extremity, we'd ask him to close your eye, please. Close your eyes, and do you feel this equally? Mm -hmm. We could instruct him to relax, and we'll do a patellar reflex. So a normal patellar reflex would be like 2 plus. And then if we were concerned like hyperreflexia or B12, uh, we would get a hyperreflexic response. So just relax, and you'd see something like this. And we can continue to demonstrate with the tap on his Achilles tendon. So we'd start right here, and we would we would get a normal reflex. And if this was a case of B12 and we were concerned about hyperreflexia, he would give us a dramatic uh, response. Okay, and you feel that. We're going to check his uh, posterior tibial pulse. So we'll, it will be behind the medial malleoli. And we could go ahead and do one at a time. Or if you're a little more comfortable, you could do, do two at a time. Just comment that it's a two plus regular rate and rhythm. And now once we're, we're finished down there, it's always a good idea to hand sanitize again. So while he's still sitting up to the cardio exam to get that out of the way. So the best way to do this here is, again, to lower the gown slightly and to ask them to please uh, sit and hold it like this. This will protect them and keep them covered up. We want to verbalize that we don't see any visible lesions in the anterior chest, no visible lesions to the posterior chest. And we'll go ahead and palpate and see if he has any chest tenderness. So please let me know. Okay, we'll do the same thing on the back. 
Maxim can do is auscultate for his heart sound, and so we'll use the mnemonic apartment M225A, and we'll listen first in his right intercostal for the aortic, and we'll go over to the left for the pulmonic, and then we'll go to the tricuspid. And now for uh, mitral, if this was a female, a good tip is to ask him to please lift up your left breast. A good comment that we hear an audible S1, S2, regular rate and rhythm, no audible S3s, S4s, or murmurs, remembers, rubs, and gallops. Once we completed the cardio, we could transition nicely to the home exam while he's still sitting up, and so we could go ahead and percuss. We'll start above his clavicle, comparing left to right. And I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing in the back, three spots. We could also rotate again, and we'll start above the clavicle. We're going to use the bell first. Please take it in the instructions you want to give. So please take a deep breath when you feel my stethoscope. Please take a deep breath in and out. Okay. Compare left to right. Do the same thing on the back now. Okay, and then we could verbalize again that there was, it was clear to auscultation, no audible wheezing. Once we concluded the cardio and pulmonary exam, we could cover him up again. Now we can instruct him, I'm going to now allow you down to do the abdominal exam, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so we want to help him down. And you don't want to forget to extend the legs for the uh, leg rest. Now you could rest your legs. For the abdominal exam, they'll have a gown here, and you want to move it up all the way to their pelvic, pelvis, and then you want to ask permission to take it up. We want to do the same step again. We want to first verbalize that we see no visible lesions. First, ask if he has any pain anywhere. Yeah, just okay. right here. A little pain on the upper right side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and start on the opposite side, on the lower left. So, okay. Go to the right. Okay, we could verbalize that there were normal active bowel sounds. He had pain on the upper right. We'll start on the lower left. Okay, and we can comment again that there were uh, normal resonance to percussion. Now we're going to go ahead and palpate. So the tip for this is for superficial first. We're just going to use one hand, and we're going to start on the lower left. And you want to make good eye contact to see if he winces at all, and, or let him know if you have any pain, to please let me know. We'll do it in the three quadrants on the bottom, three middle quadrants, and then three upper quadrants. Okay, and then we could have good confirmation that he was in pain enough for deep. We just want to place our second hand on top and do it, do it again. Okay. So we could get a little pain in there on deep. We want to go ahead and check uh, for hepatomegaly. So the best way to do this is to place your hand under the border of his liver. You want to instruct the patient to please breathe in. And then as he breathes out, you can rebreathe out now. You want to go all the way up into the lower rib cage, and as long as you don't feel the liver coming, extending below, you can verbalize that there was no hepatomegaly, and you can do the same thing for the spleen. So again, please breathe in, and now please breathe out. Okay, and you can feel the lower left rib, and there was no spleen coming down. And now that concludes the abdominal exam, so you could help cover them again, and then sit them up, because it helps you out. Okay, and then you just want to ask them if they have any questions for you. Yeah, no.